Satan started to get aggressive and the Bigfoots began to be more violent, shaking the trailer, rocking it back and forth, tossing them to and fro, throwing them around like glitter inside of a snow globe. Now, according to Boom, this went on for a solid 35 minutes, long enough for the two of them to lose their patience with the Bigfoots. They headed outside armed with many 14 rifles, shining lights into the tree lines. They could see sets of green eyes shine everywhere, growling, grunting, tree shaking, going on all around them. And I quote Chicken Man's words, we looked for the biggest, tallest, greenest eyes that we can find and we let loose in that direction, firing and moving straight at it. The growling stopped, the trees stopped shaking and the Bigfoots took off running. Now listen to this, the next morning when the sun rises, the two of them start tracking. They find signs that seven, yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those animals had been around their property. So when the workers arrive on site, the brothers come up with a plan. They tell the workers, listen, I need you guys to frame a floor in the ceiling that we can stand on. And I want you guys to close in a portion of the roof that would create a blind for us to hide in. We're going to leave the radio on and the TV on inside the trailer. And when the Bigfoots come, we're going to go ahead and deal with them and get it over with. Listen, by the end of that day, the workers have that section of roof completed temporary plywood put there the area enclosed holes cut into it creating their own blind that night they leave the radio running inside the trailer while they hide in that section of roof and wait both of them have dozed off to sleep when they start to hear tree limbs snapping in the wood line next thing you know the trailer is violently shaking and guess what looking out there are two male bigfoots nine feet tall on each side of the trailer, rocking it like a kid's toy. Boom, takes aim and fires, shooting one in the back of the head and the other one directly through the eye. These two giants literally stumble around trying to run for the tree line, but fall to the ground. And then they wait and wait and wait until other Bigfoots come out of the woods trying to drag those bodies away and they fill them up with lead as well listen to me according to boom as the bigfoot bodies began to stack up in that spot the rest of them ran off into the woods well, listen when i tell you chicken and boom weren't the people to mess with and these bigfoots learned the hard way they learned the hard way because that morning at 2 a.m they built a gigantic fire and started to burn the bodies the only thing left of the bodies were bones they took those bones broke them up, put them in the boxes. Now, they told me originally their plan was to take the bones off and bury them, right? But somehow, some way, they get a visit from a man. The very next morning, I'm talking about you can still smell the smoke. A man pulls up in the SUV and tells the two brothers that he's aware of what they're going through and what they're doing, and he's going to have to confiscate the bones. Listen to me when I tell you this. This man knows their entire military record. He knows about the bearer bonds. He knows everything about them. He threatens Chicken Man and Boom, telling them that they needed to leave the Bigfoots alone or else he would be back. But again, Chicken Man and Boom were not the two men to be trifled with. So they allow him to take the bones and that very same day, they go around the woods and start laying traps for the Bigfoots. And this is exactly what they did. Went out and gathered as much meat as possible. They took that meat and hung it in the trees around the property. Listen, and when I say meat, I'm not talking about supermarket bought meat. We talking about hog legs, entrails, you name it. It was out there in them woods. Again, that night, they stay in the small section of the roof, but all they could hear is this painful moaning and groaning coming from deep in the woods. They spent the next three nights in that blind, waiting to see if there would be any more activity, but there wasn't. So finally, they got back to work and completed construction. And with that Bigfoot problem gone, they moved on to build the next house and the next house and the next house. Since then, they've built over 250 rural homes. And I know for a fact they've encountered all kinds of strange things 
building houses in the middle of nowhere. But nothing, and I mean nothing, stops these two men. Yes, yes, Doc Waters, where have you been? I have been looking for you. You have only been putting out a small amount of content. Baron, you know what I'm saying, man. I've just been busy trying to get my mind right. You know, we just did a big deal, bro. I did a big deal. You know, I acquired 51% mm. of the Paranormal good, Media Group. Good, good, good. Uh, and I'm excited yes. man, because I'm going to use it to really help people in this field, man. I really am. I'm going to do a lot to help other people, man. Let me ask you a question. Did you pray to God before you made this decision? No, let me be specific to you. Did you pray to Jesus Christ before you made this decision? Yeah, I sure did, man. You know, it, it weighed on me heavily because, you know, Baron, you know, I'm wild. I, part of me want to, you know, always wreck shop, but I don't know, man. I just, it don't seem like the right good, thing to do. Good, good. Then put on the full armor of God and get started again. Yes, I am headed back to Bigfoot Island to make sure that everyone gets away safely. They are surrounded by the Bigfoots, but they don't know how to get away. I'll be back soon. When I am done, I will be back to sit with you and we will talk about what is coming. Imagine coming home after a 13-hour international flight from a business meeting where you had the highest expectations, but due to one of your team members, it was a colossal failure. If that's not bad enough, your boss, who's an anal retentive asshole, is holding your feet to the fire and placing the blame for the bad turnout of this meeting squarely on your shoulders. Oh, and I can't forget this bullshit while you're there your girlfriend tells you that she wants to see other people those were the circumstances surrounding my return to the United States and all I wanted to do was just get home sit on the sofa turn on the TV and drink a beer however after a two-hour commute in Atlanta traffic I arrive at my house only to notice that something is terribly wrong see my house was built in a brand new subdivision surrounded by woods it sits on three and a half acres of land and the first thing I notice is my wooden fence is leaning hopping out of the car and walking around to that side nope it's not just leaning it's broken okay going into the fence where my three dogs should be there is blood everywhere looks like a crime scene blood splatter all on the fence my above ground pool is full of blood and fur but I don't see any of my dogs anywhere the wooden steps leading up to my little deck, which is next to the pool, are cracked and splintered. So now, I'm standing there looking at all this, including the blood splatter all on the side of my house, thinking, now this is some bullshit. Going into the house, everything is fine. So I head up the street to my neighbor's house. So I head up the street to my neighbor's house. Understand, this is my neighbor who I had paid $200 to feed and make sure my dogs had water and were okay while I was gone. And pause here in the story. I want you to remember, I'm fresh off the plane, tired, already in a bad mood. I'm trying to hold it all together. I knock on her door. He opens up and I'm like, so, did you see anything crazy going down at my house? Cause my dogs are gone, the fence is down and there's blood everywhere. Now get this, he replies to me, saying yes i know what happened a werewolf did it now remember i already told you i was tired and moody i wasn't in the mood for no foolishness so i'm like come on dude really what's going on what happened to my dogs that's when he says it again a werewolf did it and closes the front door then i go to my other neighbor understand there's only three houses completely developed in this subdivision I knock on her door. She looks at me through the window and doesn't even open the freaking door. 
So I go home, call the police. They come out, look around, and tell me it looks like a wild animal attacked my dog. No fucking shit, man. But what kind of wild animal knocks down the fence and leaves a murder scene like this? I'm telling you, my backyard literally looked like something from the movie Silent Hill. The police officer says he's not sure what could have done it, but he suspects that it probably was a bear. Takes a report and tells me to be careful, then leaves. So now, after flying all freaking night long, I'm outside trying to clean this mess. Nothing could be done about the fence. I go ahead and pull the plug on a pool, drain in the water, take a bucket, add bleach, water, and soap, and scrub the blood, which is now drying off on the side of my house and my windows. Spray everything down because flies are now starting to swarm, and that's when I find the ear to one of my Labrador retrievers. Listen to me when I tell you, at this point in time, I'm just tired and pissed off. So I head inside, take off my clothes and get into the bed, light a joint, and doze off to sleep. The next morning, I had to work and get my ass handed to me by my boss. And when I tell you emotionally, I'm distraught and just freaking over everything, like I'm over everything. So I head home early, take a Xanax, and fucking sit there on the sofa, contemplate my life, watching Netflix, eating comfort food until night falls. Get this, I head up to my bedroom, circling around the bed, glance out of the window, only to see what looks like these eyes looking at my house from the woods. These huge eyes are reflecting this red color, and I'm like, nah, man, hell no. This couldn't possibly be something standing out there looking at me in the woods. But then the eyes blink, and I'm like, holy crap, this is real. So I head outside with my flashlight and shotgun. Now, pause for a moment because I need you to understand something. I didn't know anything about Dog Man. As far as I'm concerned, werewolves were things of movies. So I circle around the front side of the house along the fence, shine a light into the woods, and nothing's there. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, now you're fucking hallucinating, you're stressed out. I rationalize everything away in my head. The only thing I could think of is maybe, maybe, just maybe, like he said, it's a bear out there. We definitely have black bears in Georgia, so I write it off, go inside, head to bed, trying to put my mind to rest so I can get back to work. However, the next night I realized something absolutely terrible was out there in the woods, way worse than any bear. And my neighbor, who I asked to watch my dog, was the problem. Because about 9 p.m. that night, I hear shooting. Not like handgun shooting, but rifle shooting. I grab my shotgun, head out of the front door into my front yard and realize that the shooting is coming from his house and understand like i've explained to you before it's only the three houses back there so now i'm heading over to his house knocking on his front door his wife comes to the door hair all over the place robe on the woman looked like she just dodged the 18 wheeler on the freeway her eyes are wide open and she's like it's back it's back she literally pulls me into the house, pushing me through the living room, into the kitchen, through the back door, which leads to their raised patio. And there he was on the edge of the patio, shining a light and shooting into the trees. Now looking into those trees, there's what I would describe as a wolf man jumping down from the tree. And that's when my neighbor lays it all on me, saying, that's what killed them dogs. He puts down his rifle, picks up two freaking grenades, pulls the pin on one, chucks it into the woods, pulls the pin on the other one. I'm like, oh shit, I'm expecting an explosion, shit flying all over the place. Instead, it's this loud, deafening bang sound. And while my ears were still ringing from the first bang, I hear another one. Hands over my ears, he's now pulling me back into the house. I can't hear shit he's saying. I'm confused. His wife is standing there trembling. I'm reading his lips as he's mouthing. It won't be back for a while. Listen to me when I tell you. It took damn near a solid hour before I could even hear right. And that's when this man tells me the truth. That that creature showed up and he started shooting at it. And he decided to take my three dogs out into the woods with him looking for it but he couldn't find it. Early that morning, he heard it at my house slaughtering and killing my dog. So he went up the road to scare it off, but by the time he got there, 
the damage was already done. His wife chimes into the conversation saying, why in the hell did you shoot at it in the first place? I told you not to shoot. According to her, she was the one who was in the kitchen and saw it walking on the back side of their fence. Its shoulders were above their eight foot wooden fence. She tells him anything that fucking big, you need to leave it alone unless it messes with you. Now, the two of them are arguing. He's saying it's my job to defend the house. She's screaming and it dawns on me. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You got my dogs killed, got my fence broken, caused all these problems because you think you some kind of fucking werewolf hunter. So I tell them, listen, we're going to have to do something about this shit. I'm calling the police. That's when they tell me they had already called the police. So I tell them, let's call animal control. So we call the hotline. A guy answers and I tell him the truth straight up. My neighbor and I just finished shooting at a walking wolf. And the man on the phone goes silent. I mean silent long enough for me to have to say, hello, are you still there? Then the man says, yes, sir, I'm here. What's your address? I tell him the address and then I ask him, hey, man, what should we do? He says, did you hit it? I'm like, shit, I don't know. But what I do know is it was big. It was so big, I don't think you could really miss it. That's what this man tells us. The best advice he could give us is to stay in the house and lock the doors and don't leave the house until morning. Quite logically, my question to him is like, okay, so is somebody coming or what's going on? That's when he tells me someone will be there as soon as possible. Well, as soon as possible turns out to be the next morning at 7 a.m. Because there's a knock at the door. Keep in mind, I have not been back up the street to my house. I spent the night in their house. This man, not dressed in any ranger outfit, no police uniform, nothing like that, knocks on the door and says, you called about a wild animal. And I tell him, listen, this ain't no wild animal. This is a fucking wolf that walks around, jumps from tree to tree and lands on the ground and killed by fucking dogs. That's when he asks us to escort him to the area. So we walk him around the house to the back side of the fence and into the woods. And this man tells us to go back inside while he takes a look. Listen, the dude walked back there in the woods for like 30 minutes, comes back to the front side of the house, gets his cell phone out of his car and makes a call and then leaves. No closure, no goodbye, no I found something, didn't tell us shit, just leaves. Now get this, after he's gone, we all realize that we asked him his name and he never even responded. He just straight blew past the question. So we didn't even know this man's name. Now, I'm fucking over all this shit. So I go home, get dressed, go to work late. When I come back home that evening, the road that leads to my house is blocked. There's a guy standing there and he tells me that I can't go home. That a hotel has been arranged for me. I'm like, nah, nah, fuck that. I'm going home, my man. Like, I don't know what's going on, but I need to go home. That's when he pulls out a Homeland Security badge, flashes his gun, and says, listen, take this card, call this number, go to the hotel, you can come home in the morning. Trust me, this is better for you. Now, So now, I'm sitting in the car in front of him, I dial this number, there is silence on the line for like five seconds. What I mean by silence is, the fucking phone doesn't ring, it's just silent. Then this woman says, Mr. Lewis... Then this woman says, Mr. Lewis, a hotel room has been arranged for you at the Hilton Suites. Gives me the address and says, sorry for the inconvenience. You can return home in the morning. When I get to the hotel, my neighbors whose house I had just spent the night in are sitting in the lobby along with the other neighbor who refused to open her door. That's when I learned that the man returned, telling all of them that they needed to leave. So all of us sit there discussing this shit for the next few hours and finally come to the conclusion that there's nothing we can do. But we make an agreement that we're all going back home at the same time, 7 a.m. in the morning. So get this, the next morning we leave all at the same time, our little caravan rolling down the road. When we get there, the roadway to our house is open, pulling up to my house. The fence has been fixed. Going into my yard, the pool has been replaced. There is even new sod down in my backyard. And, get this, my house has been fucking pressure washed. 
Now, walking up the street to my neighbor's house, the trees on the back side of his property have been cut and cleared. And get this, after that one night, there was nothing. Not a fucking sound. It was almost like every critter, creature, animal in the woods around that subdivision was freaking gone. Listen, my neighbors and I have discussed this extensively. We really have. And we all have come to the same conclusion. That whatever that thing was, dog man, werewolf, whatever you want to call it, I don't care. Whatever it was, it belonged to the government. And they came and they got it. And that's why they repaired my house. That's why they cleared the trees. That's why they did everything that they did was because it was theirs. <laughs> Simple Jack, yeah, you went all out on that one, huh? You did. You really smoke for the fences, huh? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it was an intense experience. You know, I just... I just did the work. Watched a lot of retarded people. Spent time with them, observed them. Watched all the retarded stuff they did. But you know, there were times when I was doing Jack that I actually felt retarded, like really retarded. Dang. In a weird way, I had to sort of just free myself up to believe that it was okay to be stupid or dumb. To be a moron. Yeah. To be moronical. Exactly, to be a moron. An imbecile. Yeah. Like the dumbest motherfucker that ever lived. Stupid ass Jack. By the end of the whole thing, I was like, wait a minute, you know? I flushed so much out, how am I gonna jump start it up again? It's just like. Yeah, yeah, right? You was farting in bathtubs, laughing your ass off. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was just really quite a. It was crazy. It's like working with Mercury. You serious? You don't know. <laughs> Everybody knows you never go full retard. What do you mean? You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. My journey down the path to dog man discovery started with listening to interviews. My favorite interview is Fight with the Dog Man. I was a teenager when I first heard this and been fascinated ever since of listening to everyone's dog man encounters across YouTube. So I started doing my own research. And on my 21st birthday, I asked my mom to finance an expedition to this graveyard. Some coordinates I found on Facebook. We sat down and talked about my obsession. My mother, who's a veterinarian, said that these creatures couldn't possibly exist. But nonetheless, she sponsored my trip. Now listen, this was my plan. I wanted to get footage, start my own YouTube channel, and get my mom to review and comment on the footage as a veterinarian. Hell, I thought it was a neat idea. Nobody was doing it, so I run with it. Head down to Alabama. I'm there three days and find nothing. The first day, I'm out there walking around looking for evidence, but I don't see anything. I come back that night, and yes, it's freaky and creepy in the cemetery, but there's nothing going on. The next night, I'm out there about 9.30 p.m. Now, I didn't know they had security at this graveyard, but oh, I'm running to the security guard. Old black man, and he is pissed off. He says, you white motherfuckers always coming out here fucking around robbing these graves. Get your ass the fuck out of here before I shoot you. Imagine me standing there with my hands up, flashlight shining in my eyes, saying, listen, sir, I'm not here to rob any graves. I just came out here to do some paranormal investigations. But clearly, he had had some very bad encounters in his graveyard because he says, I don't give a shit what you out here looking for. Your ass needs to leave right fucking now. He lowers the light out of my eyes and I get a good look at him. Six foot four, bald headed with these moles on his face. He's now shining the light in the direction of the exit. So slowly I start walking that way. And he says, I don't even understand what the hell you think you're going to find out here. Why in the hell would you bring your ass out here? I stop, turn and say again, sir, I'm not out here to bother anybody's graves. I'm just out here to do some paranormal investigation. You know, ghost hunting, werewolves, monsters, Bigfoots. This look comes over his face as he scans my body up and down. And I guess he came to the realization that I wasn't a threat. So I show him the video footage I have. Me just walking around the graveyard, not touching anything, not doing anything. That's when he literally grabs me by my arm and begins to drag my body over by this grave and points to it and says, 
So you've been out here all night long recording and filming, and you didn't see who or what dug this grave up right here. I tell him, sir, yes, I've been out here wandering around, but I wasn't messing with no graves, and I didn't see anybody else out here messing with any graves. Listen, I came down here to get evidence of dog, man. So I wasn't going to let this man deter me. So now I'm trying to talk him into seeing things my way. And so I started questioning him. Well, sir, have you ever seen anything weird out here or anything crazy? And he says, yeah, I've seen some weird, crazy things out here. Well, that's all I'm looking for. I'm not here to bother anything. I'm not here to bother anybody. Quite frankly, if I see what I'm looking for, I'm probably going to turn around and run. Is there any kind of way you can work with me? I'm here for another night. I just need to come back tomorrow night and do some investigations. Listen, if I don't see anything, then I'm out of here. But if I do and I catch it on camera, cool. But I promise you I won't do anything. I will even come back out here and keep you company as you work just so I can do my investigation. He looks me up and down and says, I tell you what, son, it's definitely kind of creepy out here and lonely at night. Meet me out here tomorrow at 7 o'clock and we'll see what we can do. Listen to me. I'm fucking excited. Now I'm going to have access to the graveyard where there's been documented dogman activity and I'm not going to get arrested by the sheriff and this guy ain't going to shoot me in my ass. So I'm floating on cloud nine. The following evening, I get there at 630. He pulls up at seven o'clock, opens the door to his truck and says, get in. Now I'm thinking we're going to be in this graveyard, but no, 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 no. Turns out he's responsible for five graveyards in the area. So we end up riding around from one graveyard to the next to the next. Now, we're on our way from the third to the fourth graveyard, working our way back to the original one where we met at when he says, you know, I'm not sure exactly what it is you're looking for out here, but maybe I could just tell you a little bit about it. So I start questioning him. Well, can you tell me about some of the creepy and weird things you've seen out here? He says, yeah, that's why I was so pissed off at you. Just the other night, I was out here riding around doing my rounds, and I pull up in a graveyard, and I see two kids laying on top of a grave. Girl is on top of this boy riding him cowgirl style. That's why I say you white motherfuckers are nasty. I don't even know why you would be out here doing something like that. Anyway, I get out of my truck, walk up on them with the flashlights, shine a light on them, because I'm pissed. They out here with that black magic, sex magic. You know, when they make love on them graves like that, it's called soul sucking. So they out there making love on the grave, soul sucking. I shine a light on them. And when they look at me, both of them got jet black eyes. When I tell you jet black eyes, I mean complete and total black eyes. Scared the shit out of me. I pull my weapon. They hop up and take off running. Listen, this awkward silence kind of takes over as I'm trying to figure out what the hell he's talking about. And you can tell he was reliving seeing that exact thing. That silence is broken by him saying, well, what exactly is it you think you're going to find out here? Now, this is when things take a turn for the worse, because I tell him, well, I'm out here looking for dog man. He says, dog man, I ain't never heard of no dog man. I tell him, you know, upright walking wolves, werewolves. I think here in the South, y'all call it the Rougarou. Lord Jesus, why did I say that? Because he pulls over to the side of the road, slamming the brakes, squares his body up, in the truck with me and says why in the fuck would you come here looking for the Rougarou you see this the shit that I'm talking about you gonna come out here and you gonna mess with them things I already got enough problems with them digging up graves and taking bones but no you wanna come out here and you gonna rile them things up and then you gonna go back home to where the hell you came from and guess who gonna have to deal with them while they pissed off me I'm going to have to deal with the pissed off Rougarou because you out here chasing and trying to take pictures of it. Nope, not having it. This is what the fuck you going to do. You finna get your little narrow ass back in your vehicle and carry it back to wherever the hell you came from, boy. You understand me? Now, at first he's screaming at me and that's scary enough, but then he starts to whisper and he says, see, if you come around here one more time, and get them Rougarous upset. And they get to chasing me, slashing my tires, trying to get me. And I see you, I'm going to kill you. Sure enough, I'm going to pull my gun and I'm going to kill you. Now understand, the whole time he's talking to me, he's got his hand on his gun. 
and I'm getting the impression that this man is not playing whatsoever. Then he whips a U-turn, starts flying down the road, takes me back to the original cemetery where we were, and lets me out right by my vehicle, saying, nah, son, if you bring your ass back, I'm going to shoot you. If I don't shoot you, and I can't get to you, I'm going to call the sheriff, and they're going to arrest your ass. So I'm telling you, son, don't bring your ass back over here. Ain't nothing over here for you. All you're going to do is rile that Rougarou up, and it's going to lose his mind. And you're not prepared for what's going to happen when that Rougarou loses his mind. So what I want you to do is get the hell on. I want you to get the hell on right now. Listen to me when I tell you this. I didn't have a choice but to leave. Looking in this man's eyes, he was clearly capable of following through with his threat and shooting me. And I think he wanted to do it right then and there. So I got back in my vehicle and I drove home. Didn't get one shred of evidence of a dog man whatsoever. But I did learn a lesson. It's a little bit more complicated than just going to a spot looking for dog man. There's these other variables involved in the equation. Like him. Darkwater's channel is for entertainment purposes only. Although information in these stories can be traced back to relevant and true sources, Darkwater strongly discourages its viewers, listeners, and subscribers from visiting the site of incidents and encounters discussed or revealed on the show. In other words, we will not be held responsible if you are attacked by a dogman, molested by a Bigfoot, bitten by vampires, chased by chupacabras, abducted by aliens, accosted by the men in black, investigated or arrested by the local law enforcement, CIA, FBI, NSA, EPA, BLM, or another alphabet group, whether on U.S. soil or abroad. Thank you for tuning in, and enjoy the show. America is home to a centuries-old legend. A hominid creature, known by many names, Sasquatch, Yeti, the Woodsman, and the most popular name of all, Bigfoot. Tonight on the Dark Waters Channel, we travel into the world of Bigfoot, where Bigfoot truth seekers combine forces to share stories and encounters from around the world. Tonight we proudly present the Bigfoot Bonanza. My farm is located just south of Shreveport, Louisiana, and I inherited it from my grandfather five years ago. Since that day, I've grown the business to another level. One of the only commercial farms here that does more business than mine is Mahaffrey. And Mahaffrey is one of the powerhouses of Louisiana farm to food industry. Here on my farm, I grow everything. Pasture-raised chickens, pork, beef, vegetables. I employ 32 people and have over $4 million worth of equipment here. Needless to say... I was very nervous when all this activity began to happen. It started about three months ago when Jordan, my guy who manages everything to do with poultry, came into the house. He had this weird look on his face. Jordan is responsible for making sure everything goes well with my chickens, that the eggs are collected on time, that they get out and get exercise. He told me that as he let the chickens out for the day, he was walking around the fence line and noticed something strange. He said that he saw these tracks that look canine and that the tracks circled the perimeter of the fence and then led back into the woods. According to Jordan, these tracks were huge, and whatever it was must have been a big dog on all fours. Standing in front of me, Jordan was clearly disturbed by these prints and insisted that I come take a look. So we drove out to the spot near the chickens and walked the fence line. Initially, when he said big dog prints, I thought he was just talking about a big dog. But these prints were massive. This was like nothing I'd ever seen around my farm before. I now understood why he was so worried, but there was absolutely nothing I could do. And being crazy enough to try and track an animal that size into the woods, he's just looking for trouble. A few days passed, and Jordan forgot about the prints, and I turned my attention to this upcoming inspection that I had with the Department of Agriculture. You see, six months ago when I was going through my divorce, I fell way behind on paperwork. And luckily, I was able to talk to the inspector into giving me a reinspection, allowing me more time to submit the proper documents. It was 3 a.m. in the morning, the day of the inspection, and I had been working all night to get the reports finished and the paperwork filled out for the DOA when I heard a ruckus out at the cow pasture. See, my farm is wired for video and sound. 
So I went to my little video monitoring room to see what the deal was. What I saw on that camera, I couldn't believe. My cattle were all herded up against the western fence line. 300 of them, huddled together in fear. And at the eastern side of the fence was some kind of creature. Its eyes glistened this green color on the camera, and it was huge. This thing was moving in and out of the view of the camera as it would back up to the wood line and then charge the fence. Based on its thing size, it could have easily jumped over the fence or even ran through it. But it was like it wanted to scare the cattle. It was toying with them. Trying to figure out what to do, I decided to grab my cell phone and to open up the video app that allowed me to monitor the cameras mobily. Then I went to my closet and I grabbed my shotgun. This creature, whatever it was, was too big to confront. But I figured if I just went out back and fired a few rounds into the air, it would leave like any other animal would. Boy, was I wrong. I stepped out of the back door with my shotgun, pointed into the air, and fired while I was looking at the camera. This thing stopped, turned its head in the direction of the gunfire, then it starts heading in my direction. Only then did I get a full look at this thing as it jumped the fence and ran through the cow pasture coming straight towards me. I don't know if you ever seen that movie Underworld, when those creatures are running on all fours. That's exactly what I saw. It was unreal. I rushed back into the house, locking the door and headed into my office. It was now 3.35 a.m. And I would only be alone for another 10 minutes. The morning crew of workers, including Jordan, would be pulling up any minute. As I sat there with my shotgun, I watched this thing circle the house, sniffing. And somehow it pinpointed the very room that I was in. That's when I heard the scratching and banging on the walls. I can't express to you how terrified I was. For the next nine minutes, all I thought about was that I was going to die. This creature was going to break down the wall and eat me. I looked at the camera as this thing on all fours kept banging against the wall with its shoulders over and over and over again. And the scratching. Oh my God, it was something out of a nightmare. Looking back on it all now, this thing had to be trying to intimidate or scare me. Because it didn't make sense. If it wanted into the house, it could have just ran through one of the glass doors or broken down the front door. It seemed like it was forever, but finally my watch beat 345, and I could hear the trucks begin to pull in the parking lot out front. Jordan and his crew were always the first there in the morning. I watched on camera as this thing looked directly at the light of the trucks. Then with speed and agility, unlike anything I'd ever seen before, it ran off towards the back of the farm. Jordan and his men were walking around the side of the house when I came out the back door. My face must have given it all away because Jordan's first question was, Did you see it? All I could do was nod my head yes. That's when he told me about the dog man and how it had been seen all over the United States, especially in Louisiana. Jordan had me listen to several shows and that's how I found you. We've been using the powder that your guys recommended and have gone as far as to maintain a perimeter around our farm with it. I haven't seen this creature since we made the changes. However, I'm starting to hear rumors that other farms in the area are having similar problems, except for they've lost chickens and cattle. I'm even hearing about more than one of these things appearing at the same time. I hope this is my one and only time ever seeing Dogman. I'll never forget my first time seeing a dog, man. To Black Southern Baptist, and I can never forget that day. It was at a revival service. Back in those days, Christian revivals were held outdoors, inside tents. And to paint a clear picture for you, if you can imagine being outside on a hot summer day with a huge white tent set up, rows and rows and rows of chairs, a makeshift stage and people were heavy in the worship. This is my first time going to a revival. Although I had been dragged in and out of church every Sunday my entire life, I thought it was interesting. The way people worship out of the church was completely different than the way they worshiped in church. It was much more intense. And I could never forget the sounds of that day. The revival had started at about 3 o'clock. And it gone on for hours. And right as the sun began to set and the pastor started doing the altar call to save souls, something weird started to happen. From my position on the right hand side of the back row, I started to hear the strange sound coming from the woods. But I wasn't sure what it was. Amen. You could hear it faintly, just above the sound of the singing. 
Then as the singing and the clapping stopped, I could hear it clearer. Something was growling and growling loudly. Initially, I thought I was hearing things until my grandmother started looking in the same direction as the sound. Then others in the congregation began to look that way too. And out from the wood line stepped something I had never seen before and hoped to never see again. This thing was massive, nine feet tall, with the huge head of a wolf. Its fur was black, jet black, and its upper body had more muscles than anything I had ever seen. It just stood there, showing its teeth and growling. The people in the congregation finally caught on to it and began to run. The pastor grabbed his Bible and began to pray, repeatedly saying, Get ye behind me, Satan. Get ye behind me, Satan. Until one of the deacons grabbed him by his collar and pulled him, yanking him off the stage. Everyone ran back to their cars and fled the area. I never knew exactly what that was that I saw until I heard you on Coast to Coast AM talking about the dog man. I'm sure that not only did I see a dog man, but 200 other people. When I was told by my friend that you were not critical of him when he told you about his dog man experience, at first I was skeptical. However after speaking with you I realized that you are the real deal. This encounter I'm going to share with you can be verified by my 19 year old son. Both my son and I are what you call Cajuns here in Louisiana. I spend the majority of my free time hunting and fishing in the bayous of southeast Louisiana. Per our agreement I am not disclosing exactly where this happened, I still have to live and work in this area, but I will do my best to paint a clear picture of the surrounding. It was early August and my son and I had spent the entire day fishing, I have an 18 foot Aluma craft boat with a Yamaha 40 motor. On the front I mounted a trolling motor, it is a Minnesota Kota 45 pound thrust battery powered setup. The max speed on this motor with two people on my boat is 12 miles per hour through calm waters. It was just turning dark when our encounter began. The Yamaha 40 motor on my boat was noticed also my son and I always tried to get out of the bayous before dark. As expected the Yamaha 40 was stalling and slow to crank up. As I pressed the ignition she wouldn't turn over. We didn't want to flood the engine so instead we began using the trolling motor to travel along the bayou to head home. It was no big deal we had done this many of times. It did mean that a 20 minute ride through the bayou would now take an hour. We were rounding a bin near the levee when everything went quiet. My son brought it to my attention. Papa listen, he said. Everything is so quiet. There was not a sound, no birds, crickets, no fish splashing, the only sound was the steady hum of the trolling motor. In order for you to understand what happens next I have to explain the area we were in. The levee is for storm surge protection, it's 12 to 15 feet tall in spots, along this waterway. The levee is on our left hand side, on our right hand side is primary forested wetland. The bayou. What's up ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy Dog Waters with another episode of Out of Left Field And for those of you who are new, who are new to the Dog Waters channel um, To explain to you what Out of Left Field is It is 
a storytelling format that I came up with that's real free flowing. It's very free flowing. It's um, it's not like the highly produced stories with the music and the sound. Well, it has music, but it doesn't have all the background sounds and everything else. It's essentially the same thing as when I do a radio interview. The same concept. It's just me telling you guys a story, not live, but as close to live as possible, right? So it's one of the fan favorites. Hadn't done a, a one of them in a while. And just so you'll know, the reason why I end up uh, getting doing these is because there's time periods where I go through, I mean, like call after call after call after call from people. And if you don't know the way the stories, there's two ways stories appear on Adult Waters channel. Um, one is these are stories that my friends tell me that are very close friends of mine. And then there's other stories that are kind of submitted verbally to me through members of the Dark Waters family where they call my phone number and I talk to them over time. So there's three ways. And then the third way is that some of the stories from Phantoms and Monsters blog, which we have a monetization agreement with, are put on the channels as well. So some of them are super high format, like um, Bigfoot Expedition in Alaska, Killing Bigfoot, or Siege of Lock and Ranch, or then it kind of dumbs down to you know, three scary stories, four scary stories, blah, 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 blah. And then you get out of left field, which is this. So out of left field, that's an explanation for you. Boom. So I've been talking to, um, you guys got to forgive me for the kind of heavy breathing, but it's kind of stuff. I'm stuffy. I've been talking to a number of people and I had a couple of encounters that I think are just insane. Right. As you guys know, I do not like dealing with the demon possession whole demonic thing but i did have the occasion of running into a young lady who i grew up with she was older than me she's definitely older than me i think she's four years older than me maybe five years older but her brother and i used to be childhood friends so i ran into her at mardi gras just i mean most random thing on the planet and i almost didn't recognize her because she had so many tattoos and four or five children with her and she told me that her brother was in federal penitentiary. So she says, hey, give me your phone number. My brother would like to speak to you. And I'm like, all right, cool. And I'm not giving you the guy's name. I give you one of his aliases. His alias is Magnolia Red. Or one of his aliases is Magnolia Red. So I give her my number. Come home. A couple of days pass. My phone rings. I get a call from a correctional facility. If you ever had a phone call from a correctional facility, you know that call is a collect call. Um... And so I take the call and it's this guy that, man, you know, I literally grew up with. I mean, we played football in a lot across the street from my house. And um, and so we were just talking, you know, and he's like, man, you know what you've been up to, how you been. And I'm telling him that I'm sorry that, you know, you're in this situation. I didn't even know that he had gone up. I didn't ask him what he went to prison for because I kind of got an idea already because based on how he was as a kid, I can imagine to you know some of the things he did but anyway moving forward phone call one is just kind of us just chopping it up um at the end of that call he says hey man you know do you mind if i call you because it gets a little lonely in here do you mind if i write would you write back or would you send me a letter boom 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 um can you send me some magazines you know just he trying to get stuff and I, i'm cool with it you know because I mean, he's not the only friend i have in there so he calls back two days later and he's really interested in what I'm doing. So I tell him about, you know, the Dark Waters channel. I tell him about my real estate investing. I tell him about, you know, a couple of the business ventures that I have going on. And he's like, man, you know, I'm real proud of you. You always been real smart. The whole shebang. And he says, well, I got a story for you. And I'm like, well, what kind of story you got for me? Now, I didn't know that Red's grandmother was into voodoo. I didn't know that at all. I mean, I I met Red's grandmother a number of times, a number of times when we were kids, but I didn't know his grandmother was in the voodoo. And so Red goes on to tell me that um, he moved out of our old neighborhood uh, a couple of years after I moved out. And he moved to another neighborhood uptown. Now, this was his choice because he could have stayed where he was, but he wanted to he wanted to move out. And go with his half brother, where his half brother lived, and his half brother lived in a very, very rough neighborhood. He moves uptown, 
by his half brother. And his half brother is a dope dealer. Not just a regular dope dealer. You know, like there's dope dealers. There's guys who sell, you know, um, there's guys who sell weed. You know, they might sell you an ounce of weed. You know what I'm saying? And then there's guys who's got weed, but they got like garbage cans full of fucking weed at their house, right? You know, like garbage cans, like the kind that you pick up leaves with. You know, there's guys who sell heroin. Then there's those guys that have kilos of drugs. Well, these are the type of drug dealers that, and over time he gets into these battles with people. His half brother gets killed. And then the, the four of the other people that he's working with get murdered. So basically, his enemies are closing in on him. And Red makes a deal with the demon. Which, now guys, let me pause right here. Because when he's telling me this on the phone, I'm like, why are you telling me this? Like, why why would you even tell me this? He's like, well, man, you're doing stories. I'm going to tell you, you know, I'm going to tell you my story. He makes this deal with a demon. I will not repeat the name. Y'all know I don't play that foolishness. But he makes this deal with this demon. And his deal was that he would be able to run the drug trade in exchange for his soul while i'm talking to this dude i'm like dog like because you know I, I guess he didn't expect me to believe him guys i guess he didn't expect me to to you know just be like yeah i guess he expected me to be like nah bro you crazy hang up the phone but my first reaction is what's the purpose of that like revenge and money when somebody say i run this i'm the shot caller so in his mind he was gonna be the shot caller he the one calling shots taking people out and making sure that he ran the streets well he got what he wanted he got what he wanted for five years he was on top then on the fifth year the fifth month the fifth day it's exactly how he described it he was sitting in a car outside one of the little corner stores and he had just opened what we call a hawaiian punch i don't know if y'all ever had a hawaiian punch he had just opened a hawaiian punch and started drinking and a 13 year old little boy that he knew walked up to him and shot him he said the kid was scared kid didn't hit him in the chest the kid hit him in the stomach like on the right side of his body towards his stomach towards his liver and hit him in the leg and he pulled off so he drove off he was trying to drive himself to the hospital passed out bam he hits a telephone pole of course emergency services come out police ambulances because he's been shot and all the rest of this stuff he's he got all kind of shit on him that he don't need he got drugs in the car he got unregistered firearms in the car goes into the hospital recovers from being shot ends up going to trial and going to prison what he told me was this he said yeah man i made that deal and i got what i wanted for a limited time but i never thought that i would spend the rest of my life in prison and, and, and it was heartbreaking for me it really was it was heartbreaking for me because i've said so many times that you know a lot of stuff that goes on in this world is spiritual warfare and unfortunately to have somebody that i, I mean i dude i mean i know this brother like i crazy but needless to say Red, I did your story. I don't even know if you're going to be able to chance to hear this. Uh, there's no way for me to kind of reenact your story. But, Red, I did your story, man, and, and hopefully you, you'll hear it. All right. The next person I talked to, and I'm only really doing two of these. The next person that I talked to, this lady, when we first started talking, it took a little while for me to, to start trusting her. Because she started off telling her story, and she was excited about telling her story. And when it comes to this particular topic, which is dog, man, I find that when people are excited to tell me the story, you're normally a little bit off. Right. But it turns out that's just how she is. She's just an excitable person. Um, and considering her circumstances, I think it's amazing the type of personality that this woman has, because uh, this woman's blind. Right. And like I said, when I first started talking to her, you know, when you first start talking to a person on the phone, you have no freaking clue. They blind. The fact that she's blind comes out when she's telling me the story. Now, a dull man encounter happens to her when she's out with her son, uh, and they're on a walking trail in Arkansas. Early in the morning, she's walking behind her son, and she's 20 yards behind him. He always keeps her in, in eye shot, and he can look over his shoulder and see her, and he'll get ahead of her and slow down, let her catch up with him. He wants to make her feel independent. I've spoken to her and her son. 7.30 in the morning, the sun is out. It's not foggy. To describe this trail that they're walking on, as you're walking around, you kind of circle around a park, and then on the outskirts of the park, there's just these woods. So, you know, while you're walking around the park area, pretty wide open, but when you get on, on the outskirts of the park, 
which when you're taking your larger loop around you kind of go into the woods and then you come back out and you come back out on the other side of the park so they walk around the park and then they get to the part of the trail where they're going into like the little wooded area but it's not like woods like some spooky sleepy hollow type tv show woods it's just walking through some freaking woods but it's not it's a trail that a lot of people use as they're walking he looks back and he notices that she stopped like dead in her tracks and so he's standing there looking at her and he's saying to himself you know what is she doing she normally just keeps walking and keeps up with him from her perspective at the same time this was happening she told me that she was starting to hear this low rumbling growl from her left which is the pretty much the wood line that leads into the woods they're on a trail to the wood on the left side it leads deeper into the woods on the right side there's like trees but if you get on the other side of those trees you're right back in the park where from her left side she's hearing this low growling sound and she's thinking it's a dog right she's like oh my god i got you know i got a dog up on me right now in her mind the best thing to do was stop try and get a sense of where it was from the sound and she knew that if she stopped her son would eventually turn around and see that she stopped the growling was low but it wasn't strong it sounded like a regular dog so she starts walking again she's like okay well at least if it moves i'll know what i can do so she starts walking she hears whatever it is moving along the tree line paralleling her and then she hears a growl again but this time it's strong i mean it's loud simultaneously her son who's ahead of her hears the growl so he starts running towards her because he's like i don't know what the hell this is from the son's description he sees this gigantic head freaking dog head is what he said he said it looked like a big german shepherd head poke out from behind a tree to where you could see it on a trail and the head was uh, looking at his mother now from her perspective she heard the growl she said i got this sense and she's like i, I couldn't see what it was but i felt it she's like i felt its intentions and i felt like whatever this thing was it was evil and it was right there in front of me so you got this head sticking out of the trees and it's in between her and her son her son is jogging back towards her and he's no more 20 30 yards away he sees this head and he starts screaming at it hey ah ah like screaming trying to get it get his attention because he's thinking whatever this big dog is is about to freaking eat his mom the thing turns and looks at him and now you got to keep in mind this is this man's mother this is how afraid he was and he stops running he said man this thing looked at me like it was going to kill me he was like dude i ain't gonna lie i was scared of course it's the mother who ended up running this thing off she takes her walking stick and she just starts swinging it and screaming she said I, it didn't matter i just knew it wasn't going to take me without a fight the son says when she starts doing that it looks back at her and it stares at her like what the hell is this woman doing the insane thing about this whole encounter is as she's swinging that stick and being as brave as you can expect a person to be under those circumstances this thing looks at her and backs back into the wood line and he says he watches this thing back it doesn't turn around and walk away it just keeps stepping backwards into the wood line he grabs his mother by the hand they cut through the trees because you got to walk around the path to get back to the park area they cut through the trees across the park to the parking lot in the car and they leave and they haven't been walking in that area again to me the story was just like almost was like i thought it was an exact not even an exaggeration to be honest i thought the story was a lie when i first heard it based on how exciting and how excitable she was when she was telling the story but what i've discovered about this woman and i alluded to this earlier is i've discovered that although she's blind and has to have a walking stick and she's probably the most happy person that i've ever talked to i mean the kind of person that when she calls me it's like hey dark what's going on like raises my spirit so um I can say that I'm truly honored and blessed to be able to share her encounter. I believe her encounter is 100% true. I'm happy that it worked out the way it did. And, you know, guys, I'm 
I kind of stray away from Dogman because I think that a lot of the stuff that comes with Dogman lately has just been straight up bullshit. I'm going to be honest with you. And then with the overreaching people, they won't call it Dogman, but they call it werewolves. And then they just put out a thousand fucking stories that are just insane. I'm very, very selective now on um, the Dogman stuff. And I have a lot of good Dogman stuff that I'm holding on to. But this one was one that I promised her that I would tell. And I, and so... My lady, that's your story, and I hope you enjoyed it because I enjoy talking to you. And as you know, you can call me anytime. All right, guys, those are the two stories that I wanted to share with you guys for the Out of Left Field. I hope you enjoyed them. Um, what's coming up next is uh, I'm doing some Bigfoot Bonanza. That is pretty much done. Then we're going to go to some stories that I got about pterodactyls. or I don't even call them pterodactyls. I would call them thunderbirds. Some thunderbirds. And then I'm not sure what comes after that, to be honest with you guys. You know, I'm toying with I'm toying with doing my very first uh, where you take kind of like the top five, blah, blah. You know how people do the top five, blah, 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 blah. Well, taking one particular topic and taking a documentary format to kind of explain the details of what's what along with the stories and blending them in. I'm toying with doing that. I started to try and do it with Dogman. But I, I just decided I didn't. I don't even want to do it. Um, and so I'm thinking about doing that with these vampire stories that are here. Um, the problem I have with the vampire stories is some of the stories that I have are so true, and they've been vetted so much that even to put them out, I'm I'm afraid. I'm not afraid, but I'm yeah, I'm scared. Fuck it, I'm afraid to put those stories out. And if I can wrap them in and, and weave them into something else, I will feel a lot more comfortable. You know, I really would feel a lot more comfortable. Um, so, yep. Yeah. But anyway, that is it for Out of Left Field, ladies and gentlemen. I'll do a little editing to this. Not a lot. I'll add a little music to it. Antiki Hama, oh, what you are, reaches near and reaches far, from white-capped mountains to crystal lakes, sing out loud for Tiki. There be werewolves in these mountains. That's exactly what the camp counselor said while we are all sitting around the fire at summer camp. Did I believe him? Hell no. Was he right? You bet your ass he was. We're two weeks in the summer camp. It's fishing day. And all the campers in the camp have certain times of day that they go fishing. Kind of like a class schedule. Where our time is from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And just so you understand how our camp was set up. It's based on the south shore of a lake. On the north side of that lake is a mountain range. On the east and the west is nothing but woods. Now, before I tell a story, do not bother asking me the name of this camp because it's still operational. And there is absolutely no way I'm telling you this location because I don't want some crazy retard going to the camp, provoking these things, and God forbid, causing someone's child to come up missing. Now, with that being said, these events are etched into my mind forever. We're there in canoes on the lake. It is a total of 10 kids and three counselors. There are four kids and one counselor in one canoe, four kids and one counselor in a second canoe. And then there is myself, Fat Billy, and Kevin, my favorite counselor, in another canoe. Now, a little bit about Kevin. Kevin literally looked like Patrick Swayze had that same flow and beautiful hair. And when I tell you that I looked up to this dude, I thought he was the coolest person on the planet. Every girl in camp and every female counselor were swooning over him. Like I said, it's me and Fat Billy in the boat with him. We're fishing on the north end of the lake when Kevin says he has to pee. And so we paddle the boat over to the shore. He hops up and runs into the woods. I remember the sun was in the process of going down. He was taking forever. I'm standing up in the canoe looking for him saying, how long does it take for this dude to pee? That's when Billy and I hear this combination of a growling, barking sound coming from in the woods. But it's not normal. It's loud. I mean, stupid loud. Then there's this growl. And I see Patrick Swayze come running full speed out of the woods. He dives into the water 
pulls the anchor rope that is attached to our canoe, ties it around his chest, and starts to swim like Jaws is in the water chasing him. Looking back over his shoulder, screaming, paddle the boat, paddle the boat. Like I told you, it's just me and Fat Billy in this canoe. I start paddling because I thought Patrick Swayze was the coolest person on the planet. And if he was scared of something in those woods, then I knew that I needed to be afraid. So now I'm paddling, but Fat Billy is sitting there twiddling his thumb. And when I say he's fat, we are 13 years old. Billy is fat and weighing down the boat. Listen, we had to be about 45, 50 yards away from shore. And then this growling start and the echo bounces up and down off the water. The most frightening thing I have ever heard. The rest of the campers and the counselors start trying to get off the water. Some of them going east and some of them going west. But Patrick Swayze is literally swimming the length of this lake dragging us all the way back to camp when we finally get back to the boat launch he is exhausted crawls out of the water and just lays on the ground imagine the scene he's laying there hair all messed up chest pumping breathing hard and he tells me and billy to go back to our bunks now over the next few days i'm looking for kevin but he ain't nowhere to be found so i'm asking what's going on what happened nobody answers the questions get this following year we come back to camp we're there for about two and a half three weeks and then all of a sudden they send everybody home i mean call everybody's parents to come pick us up and i remember riding in the car with my parents on the way home them talking about something about a forest fire the following year i come back to the camp there's no issues the year after that no issues the year after that no issues then next year i decide that i'm going to take a job as a counselor at the camp we're there having a camp counselors meeting before the kids arrive. The director is going through his protocol about how to make sure the kids are safe and blah, 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 blah. And I ask him about taking the kids fishing and he looks at me and says, hell no, we will not be doing that. When the other counselors inquire about why, he goes into the story of what happened to Kevin. Explains to them how Kevin was out on a canoe fishing with two kids on the north side of the lake went into the woods and understand this is my first time hearing this whole story he went into the woods to take a pee realized that he had to do more than pee laid his back up against a tree pulled his pants down took a poop when he stood back up and started working his way back to the lake he heard something moving then realized that there was a large animal running towards him it stops stands up on two legs and does this barking growl scares the hell out of kevin he takes off running dives into the water grabbing the rope and swimming all the way back to camp with two little kids the camp director is telling the story the look on his face is as serious as a heart attack but all the other counselors are sitting there laughing like it's a game then they ask him about what happened to kevin and he explains that the very following morning, Kevin got up, got into his pickup truck, and drove away. They didn't hear anything about him and had not seen Kevin ever since. Again, these guys are all sitting there cracking jokes, being disrespectful, until I explained to them that I was one of the kids inside of the canoe that Kevin was dragging. And that's when they realized that the director was not bullshitting. Then he goes on to explain to everyone what he called the werewolf protocol. He said the following year after Kevin had that incident, it's four o'clock in the morning and something came into camp that was massive. He looked out of the window and saw it and it looked exactly like a werewolf. It was walking around stalking and peeking through the cabin windows at the children. Now, listen, right there in his office, I came to the realization as to why they shut down camp years ago when I was a kid. There was no damn threat of a fire. One of those things came into the camp. Listen, the director tells them he's made modifications to the camp to ensure that it doesn't happen again. But they still didn't take him seriously. Now, by modifications, what he meant was the entire camp was lit up at night. I'm talking about lit up like a high school football field. There was not a space or spot around that camp that you had to visit at night that was not lit up. 
The only problem was it really destroyed the ambiance of being like at camp in the woods. So a couple of weeks after the kids get this, late at night, all us counselors are up and we decide we're going to go down to the lake, light a fire, have some beers, smoke some marijuana, hang out and chill, right? We're there, the fire's lit, everybody's drinking, laughing, having fun, and I hear what sounds like something moving in the trees to the left of me. I mention it to everyone and they write it off. Five minutes later, it sounds like something huge is jumping from tree to tree coming around the lake on the right side of us. And I stand up telling them, listen, I think it's time for us to go back into the light and get away from this area. But none of them want to listen, so I leave them there. Head back to my bunk, lay down, go to sleep. 2.30, 3 o'clock rolls around, they come barging into the door, eyes wide open, acting crazy, saying that something tried to sneak up on them from the water, and it was big and hairy. All of these counselors are looking at me for answers. And I tell them, you've already been warned about what the fuck is out here. There is nothing that I can do for you. I turn over and go back to sleep. I remember this super clear. It was exactly 14 days after that happened at the boat launch that the director shut the camp down. Why, you ask? Because he was doing one of his routine morning checks. He's walking around, checking a facility, and realizes that the entire circuit box that controlled the gigantic lights out there has been ripped off the wall and is gone. When I tell you he walked into our bunk, told us to go to our assigned children and tell them to start packing all of their shit because he is shutting the camp down because there are no lights. This man was serious. Everybody was leaving that camp by nightfall. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody, even kids whose parents he couldn't get in contact with. He took them home with him. That's how serious this man was about the things that were going on around that camp. Listen, after that, I went off to college and started working on getting my degree. I know for a fact that that camp is still there. I know for a fact that he still directs that camp. But I can tell you one damn thing for sure. If it's open when I have kids, there's no way in hell my children I'll go into that camp. Mm -mm. No way in hell. Driving for Amazon in the country of Alabama is so much more different than when I worked in Montgomery. In Montgomery, the routes are shorter with stops all over the place inside of the city. But man, when I decided to take a job working for this new warehouse that delivered out in the country, talk about wild. See, it was the greed that got the best of me. They were paying nine more dollars per hour. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I will take that job any day of the week. But nobody bothered to explain to me that the stops were 10 to 15 miles apart and that I would be traveling damn near 100 miles in a freaking day, sometimes only to deliver boxes the size of my hand. Anyway, it's my last run of the day and I'm way up north in Allison, Alabama. The sun is down on Ryan Down Highway 53. This place is so far out in the country, honestly, if my freaking GPS would talk, it would be like, dude. You are out in the sticks, turn around, danger, turn around, danger. Nonetheless, it tells me to turn right down this road and says my destination will be up ahead on the left. Okay, so I turn down this dark road. It's got trees overhanging the road like a freaking horror movie, but I don't see no house and I don't see no mailbox. Then the road comes to a dead end. So I turn the van around, riding slowly, looking for at least a mailbox. I'm riding along and this man jumps out into the road with his hands up in the air, waving, screaming, saying, hey, hey, are you Amazon? I drive a van with Amazon on the front, the side, and the back, 
And I'm thinking to myself, shit, this man looks crazy. He cannot read. What the fuck is about to go down? He tells me that he's been waiting for his generator for over a week. And I'm like, okay, so you don't want me to leave it right here in the road. Where's your house? That's when he walks over to the side of the road and opens up what looks like trees and brush. But it's an entire fence decorated to look like trees and brush. Now I'm saying to myself, oh, hell no. This is some Texas Chainsaw Massacre type bullshit. Who in the fuck lives like this? He tells me to drive up the driveway. So, so I turn and drive up this driveway. There's trees on both sides of the road. Then it opens up and I see some of the weirdest shit I've ever seen. This man's house is nice. In fact, it's absolutely beautiful. Well manicured lawn, wrap around porch with a swing, painted white. I mean, absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful gas lamps outside. The only problem is this dude has crucifixes all over the place. I mean, big old crucifixes on the side of the house, little white crucifixes in the front yard. And I'm saying to myself, holy crap, I done rolled up on the end of the world cult. Let me give this man his generator and get the hell out of here. But So I pull up, open up the back of the van. Understand, this generator is heavy as hell. And he says, so you're the new Amazon guy. I'm like, yes. And he says, have you heard what happened to the old guy? I'm like, uh, no. Now, I have this heavy generator on the dolly. I'm rolling it up to his front steps. And he says, listen, I know this may be an inconvenience to you. But I tend to order a lot of stuff from Amazon. But if you deliver to my house first, you should be fine. Do not wait until after dark to deliver to my house. It's not safe. I look around, see all of these crucifixes. And honestly, I'm not trying to be a smart ass when I say this to this man. But I said, listen, based on all these damn crucifixes you got out here, this looks like the safest place in the United States. But he just smiles at me and says it keeps the evil away then he grabs that generator drags it into the house and before he closes his front door he says will you close the gate behind you when you leave all you have to do is grab the two ropes and pull them and it will latch automatically so i hop in my van drive back down that roadway park along the road get out walk around to so i'm standing there for a split second marveling at how this man has decorated his front gate sure enough there are two ropes there when you pull them the gate closes and he even has this fake foliage that protrudes all the way out and disguises the dirt road underneath it imagine the scene i have to circle around the front of my van to get in and drive off so i'm in the process of circling around when i hear this yelling screaming roaring growl scares the bejesus out of me hopping in the van cranking it up flooring it pulling away and when i look through that side view mirror i swear to you if i'm lying i'm flying there is a giant black wolf standing on two legs that walks out into the road and it's looking at my van i see the red reflected in its eyes it's from my tail lights listen this was the first time i delivered to the mosley's property the second time, I damn near had a fucking heart attack. Gonna get a lot of dough. Anything is possible. Turn me up in the headphone. Yeah. Trying to get a lot of dough and dirt the water obstacles, cause anything is possible. Yeah. Oh man, I got a lot of gold. Stack that bread and buy my nose. Anything is possible. Yeah. yeah. Trying to get a lot of dough and dirt the water obstacles, cause anything is possible. All right, fast forward. The next day, I'm off work, and the following day, I go in. When I get to the warehouse, I ask my supervisor what happened to the last dude that worked my route. He answers me with his aggravated tone, asking me why. And I tell him, listen, one of the homeowners on my route alluded to something bad happening. I just want to know what's going on. The problem was my supervisor is not the straightest fork in the draw. Dude is dumb. So he starts to ask me, what do I mean by elude? And I got to go through the process of explaining to him what the word eludes means. And once he has the understanding of exactly what I'm saying, his reply is, oh, nothing happened. But he can't look me in my eyes. So now I'm shifting my head, bending my neck, trying to look him in his eyes. And I'm like, dude, why are you lying? 
even with me calling him out, he still can't look me in my eyes. And he says, look, don't worry about it. It's nothing. So a few days pass and there's no deliveries for Mr. Mosley. Then Friday comes around and he's got two packages. So I listen, take that shit over to his house first thing in the morning. Understand, this is way out at the end of my route. So I start there and begin working my way backwards. I get to his house, open the gate, and all those crosses in the yard, over 50 of them, are broken, thrown all over the place. Looks like no one's home. So I deliver the packages and leave. Next time I come to the house, the crosses are back in place, and Mr. Mosley is sitting on the porch. I ask him how he's doing. He tells me he had a long, long night. Then he goes on and continues with this coded secret language talk that he had been doing the whole time, saying, you know what? You're smarter than the other gentlemen who work this route. You make adjustments. Life is all about adapting to change. Understand, he's sitting there in a chair, swinging back and forth, and he's got that middle stare looking off into the distance like this man has so much crap on his mind that it's weighing him down. Get this, as I'm leaving his front porch, headed down the driveway to go back to my truck, I notice spent shotgun shells all over the front yard. Stopping, picking one of them up, I say, hey, what you been shooting at like this? That's when he replies, werewolves. But he says it so casually and calm, like nothing was wrong with the words that came out of his mouth. Now, based on what I had saw that, I figured it was the perfect time to ask him what happened to the last guy who worked this route. And he says, oh, oh, you talking about Chris, man, he was such a good kid. But he couldn't take it anymore. You see, Chris was hard-headed. Thought he could do things his way. Real stubborn. But he found out things around here don't go the way you want them to just because you think they should go that way. Now I'm poking and prodding him, trying to figure out what happens. And that's when he tells me that Chris, the last driver who had this route, had his van ran off the road by a werewolf, slammed into a tree. Now pause right here in the story for a moment because I know it sounds like a stretch. But remember... I saw this thing with my own two eyes. I did not want to believe that what this man was saying to me was the truth, but I had absolutely no other options based on everything that I saw. And when I say I didn't want to believe, I'm telling you, I didn't want to believe that I was driving into an area every day that when the sun went down, monsters were running around. So I decided right then and there to prove to myself that what Mr. Mosley was saying was pure and utter bullshit. I ask him, hey, do you have a way to get in contact with Chris? And he he goes inside, comes back out with Chris's cell phone number written on a piece of paper. I leave, drive my route towards the end of the day when I deliver my last package. I call Chris on the phone, but there's no answer, and his voicemail is full. Next time I'm at the warehouse, I ask my supervisor about him again, and he gets angry, tells me to stop asking him questions about Chris. Listen, over the next few days, Mr. Mosley has no packages so i'm just moving back and forth going on about my business and i'm kind of trying to put the whole situation out of my head when i get a call from an unknown number when i answer it's chris and i may have jumped down his throat too fast and i tell him listen bro i work your old route mr mosley gave me your number told me something bad went down and i just need to know what happened because i'm on this route look Chris's response completely and totally fucked me up because the first thing he says is have you seen the men with the military backpacks yet and I'm like no I haven't seen anybody with any backpacks and he says good because they are the handlers he says if you don't see them then you are fine but the moment you come in contact with them understand be careful what you say because they are the ones that control the werewolves I know it sounds crazy, but I'm just telling you my story. Chris goes on to explain to me that the thing that ran his truck off the road was actually sent after him. And I'm like, by who and why? Right then and there in the middle of me asking him that question, not only does my cell phone hang up, but the damn cell phone restarts itself and goes into safe mode. Almost as if someone was telling me that I needed to get my ass off the phone with Chris it wasn't safe imagine a scene i'm there driving along in my truck thinking to myself yo this is some straight up cloak and dagger bullshit i have absolutely no interest in this whatsoever all i'm trying to do is make my deliveries and make my money this is some bullshit now when i'm done for the day i pull back up to the warehouse get out head inside and i'm debating in my mind if i should talk to my boss about this at all But I'm kind of pissed off because I'm feeling like, listen, bro, you got me out here hanging. 
Like you could have told me there was some weird, crazy shit going on. So I confront him and I say, hey, boss, listen, I talked to Chris, who used to work here. And I'm confused because I'm trying to figure out why you didn't take some time to explain to me that there's some X-Files conspiracy going on with this route. That's when he finally pulls me into his office, closes the door and says, look, drive your fucking route and shut up. I don't need them people coming back in here messing with us, bro. All you need to do is drive your route. If there's a problem at the Mosley house, go in the daytime and you will be fine. Don't go over to that house at night and you shouldn't have any issues. But hold on, for you listening to the story, I need you to understand something. You see, I'm standing there feeling played because he knew this shit from the time I was hired. He knew all this shit from the time he gave me Chris's route. So that wasn't going to work for me, man. Dude, you sent me into harm's way. Those were the exact words that came out of my mouth. Bro, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with you, but you sent me into harm's way with no warning. I don't even feel like I can trust you. I don't know if I even want to keep this job at this point in time. Understand, the words that came out of my mouth wasn't so much about expressing myself or just getting it off my chest. I was dead serious. And he could tell. Like, I was angry, wanted to do something to him. That's when he looks at me. He says, you know what? So you talk to Chris, right? And I'm like, yeah, I talked to Chris. And he says, next time you talk to Chris, ask him why he didn't do what he was told to do. He says, no, you see, Chris watched too many sci-fi movies. He wanted to be a fucking hero. And he caused us all kind of problems at this warehouse. My boss puts it all in perspective for me. He says, you and I are a hell of a lot alike. And you need to listen to me. You see, I want to pay my bills. And you want to pay your bills. You took this job because of the raise. And that's the only reason why you took it. Be honest with yourself. Same reason why I took the managerial job was because of the raise. And what happened to Chris Chris brought it upon himself. As long as you understand that, you will be fine. Listen, now that I understood exactly what the hell was going down, I wasn't trying to be in the middle of none of that crap. So I continue working my route, making Mr. Mosley's house my first stop, and then working my way back all the way to the warehouse. A month passes with absolutely no issues whatsoever. Then I'm driving up the road, headed to Mr. Mosley's house, and I notice these two unmarked vans down at the very end of the road where you got to turn around and it makes a dead end. I get out, open the gate, drive up in the driveway, and Mr. Mosley is outside boarding up broken windows. And I'm like, Mr. M, Mr. M, what the hell is going on? But he quickly turns his head in my direction and begins waving, telling me, hey, everything's okay. Just leave, leave, leave fast. I'm walking up to his porch with his package, trying to talk to him. And this guy comes walking around the side of the house. Six foot seven, slender, bald headed, cargo pants on, black t-shirt, side arm on his right leg. This guy not only looks like he's the part of some type of military organization, but he looks like a badass motherfucker who's a part of some type of military organization. I'm telling you, it was the way that this man walked that let you know immediately. Uh Uh-uh, no, 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 I'm not fucking with him. Because he walks around that corner, comes all the way up to the steps of the porch where I'm at, and he says, have you made your delivery yet? Not only was it the way he walked, but it was his tone of voice. Everything about this dude just oozed. I will fuck you up in a heartbeat. I don't know why I did this, but you know how it is when you know somebody's trying to punk you and you can't really do anything about it, but you want them to know that you're kind of not afraid of them. So I'm slowly putting the package on the ground, looking up at him, and and he says, drop the package before i fuck you up and leave now imagine the scene i done dropped those two packages right there on the third step i'm backing away from him and i'm like yo mr m you okay you need anything is everything all right and he reluctantly looks back and tells me he's fine so i leave finish my route another month passes and this man has not had a package ordered whatsoever and understand mr moses was the kind of guy who had three four deliveries per week but all of a sudden nothing so much so that i have to shift my route back to being a normal route and it kind of gets to the point to where i completely forget about mr mosley then one day i pull up to the warehouse i'm checking the logs and sure enough i got a delivery from i'm actually excited because i kind of want to know what the hell happened when i left so i head on over to the house and when i get there the fence is no longer camouflaged and disguised There's an actual mailbox right there off the road. And the fence itself is open. 
Now I'm driving up the driveway. The house is painted blue. The crosses are gone. I park the van, take the package out, and as I'm walking up to the steps, I realize, wait, this is Mr. Moses' address, but this package is not addressed to him. So I decide to knock on the door. Do, 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 do. Amazon, this lady comes to the door. When I ask her about Mr. Mosley, she says that the previous renter died and that her and her daughter had just moved in and they were excited about renting this house. Listen, I'm standing there looking at this lady saying to myself, what the fuck do you mean Mr. Mosley died? Listen, I asked her how Mr. Mosley died and she explains to me that she didn't know. She just saw the house for rent and decided to rent it. And when she came and did the walkthrough, the gentleman who showed her the house told her that the previous renter recently died. Now, this is where it gets scary for me. Now, this right here is where it gets scary for me. I leave. I'm driving up the road, headed back to Highway 53, and two black vans block the road. And the same dude who I saw on the porch gets out, walks up to the driver's side door, and says, Mr. Johnson, you know what happens to curious cats, right? They start to lose their nine lives. I throw my hands up in there. I said, listen, bro, I don't know what's going on, but whatever y'all doing, y'all do. I'm just trying to make my money. Understand, this man is staring at me with death in his eyes. And he says, I'm glad you and I have an understanding. Be careful, Mr. Johnson. Then they allow me to leave. Another two months pass and I don't have another delivery for that address. Then when one comes and I go to the house, there's another person living there. And I ask about the previous renter, and they say that they moved and left all of their furniture in the house. When I get back to the warehouse, there's this fine-ass white girl. I mean, yoga fine. Has access to the entire database. She knows where every package has come from and where every package is going. Now, get this. I buy her lunch and ask her for a favor. I wanted to know exactly how many different people ordered packages to that particular address. She agrees to look it up for me while we sit there and have lunch. It turns out that every three to five months, it looked like someone new moved into that house. Now, straight up, I'm not telling you that I know what the fuck is going on, but I'm just telling you what I saw. I tried to call Chris back and just hold the conversation about the whole situation again, but it kept going to voicemail. So here's what I think, and it's only based on what I've seen. Those people are doing some kind of training or experimentation right there on that property. Understand, I still drive that exact same route. I still go to that house. And in the past nine months, there have been four new residents that have lived there. Listen, I don't know what type of training it is or the purpose of it or who's behind it. But all I can tell you is what I saw and what I think is going on. You decide the rest for yourself. As a kid, one of my favorite things to do was to take a road trip. I still remember my father behind the steering wheel, the sweeping turns of country back roads, the smell of fresh pine trees slithering in open windows. This particular day, we were heading to my grandparents' house. 45 minute ride on the back roads, father hated using highways, said the only people traveled those highways were fools in a rush and lazy people who wanted to stay in bed too long and didn't know how to manage their time. It's a sunny day, not a cloud in the sky. I remember the sun was that bright yellow, not like the scorching white hot sun we have these days. We're riding along the road and see a man standing there waving us down. He's got hunting clothes on, olive green vest, brown pants, green cap on his head. As we approach, he steps into the road, father slams on the brakes, and then I notice he's bleeding, blood running down his sleeve, his wrist onto the hood of the car. Help me! Help me! This look of dread in his eyes. i never seen a man look like that before. 
father jumps out of the car. He grabs him, pushing my father back towards the driver's side door, telling him we needed to go. As the two of them are tangled up in this tussle, him trying to force himself and my father back into the car, a rifle comes flying out of the wood lines. Remember the old school wooden boomerangs? That angle that they were created with? Well, that's how this rifle was bent. It comes flying out of the wood lines, spinning right over the hood of the car, and clocks this man on the side of the head. And right then and there is when I first saw Bigfoot. It's standing right outside in the open, huge chest, no neck, muscular shoulders, slim waist, looked like a giant human mixed with a freaking baboon. It's bleeding from its waist and has this huge wound. Then it decides to roar and scream so loud that it hurts my freaking ears. Understand when this happened, I'm a nine-year-old child. I remember closing my eyes, the car door closing, us speeding off, my father's breathing. It was so heavy. Can't say how fast we drove because I had my eyes closed, but it was above the speed limit for sure. And secondly, we had to be going super duper fast because I remember the car sliding to a stop in my grandmother's driveway. Father getting out and pulling me out of the car, taking me into the house. Then my grandmother on the phone with the sheriff, him coming to the house about an hour later. They're all standing outside talking. I'm upstairs listening through an open window and the sheriff saying, yeah, we went out there and found the rifle, but there's no body there. All we found were bloody drag marks across the road. You think it took him? My grandfather says, the sheriff replies, well, if he shot it or heard it, yes, sir, it probably did take him. Not much we can do about that. But it's hunting season. Yes, sir. But what can we do? We still don't even know who the hell he was. Now, when all of them come back inside, I question them, asking them about the sheriff, and they refuse to talk to me. It wasn't until about a week later when I decided to draw what I saw through that window that my dad explained to me what it actually was a Bigfoot the woodsman this giant race of people that lived in the woods of Kentucky he told me if I ever ever see one of those things I need to carry my ass in the opposite direction just like he did Man, listen to me when I tell you I didn't believe that dog man existed. In fact, there is nothing that you could have ever told me prior to seeing this that would have made me believe that werewolves were real. Why? Because I came up in a Southern Baptist household. Now, in my mind, demons existed. But werewolves? That was something out of Hollywood movies. That was until I was forced to stop in the middle of the night for gas in Silas, Alabama. The reason why I was on the road is because my long distance relationship with my girlfriend in Montgomery had taken a turn for the worse. So I decided to hop on the road and surprise her so she and I could have a conversation as opposed to us just breaking up over the phone. Understand, it's 12 midnight. I pull up to the gas station. The inside is closed. I hop out of the car, take my debit card, swipe it, pull the pump and start pumping gas. Standing there, leaning on the car, cell phone in hand, scrolling, looking at our photos on Instagram. I'm thinking to myself, you know what? If you're going to break up with me, you're going to have to see me before we break up. I'm not going to make it easy on you just to dump me and move on to the next guy. Imagine a scene. I'm standing there immersed in my thoughts when I hear what sounds like someone kick over a metal can around the side of the building. But looking in that direction, there's no one there, so my attention turns back to my cell phone. A few seconds later, my attention is diverted to the gas pump itself as I realize that it's costing me damn near sixty dollars to fill up my tank and that's when i see movement out the corner of my eye now i don't know about you but every time i find myself in a situation similar to this i'm always thinking 
it's a carjacker or a robber. Never, ever, ever would I believe that it was a freaking werewolf. Now, opening my driver's side door, reaching into the side panel, drawing my 9mm, I say, hey, listen, I don't know who you is or what you want. I just need some gas. It don't need to be no shootout out here. Let me get my gas and go on about my business or we gonna get to shooting. Just then, as the word shooting comes out of my mouth, I hear the pump clicking, signaling to me that the tank is full. So now, imagine the scene. I'm taking the knobs out, putting it back where it belongs, closing my gas tank, and sliding my body back into the driver's seat. When my butt cheek hits that seat, I hear the noise again. Except for this time, it's coming from behind me. And honestly, now I'm afraid because I know this is not happening by accident. So I quickly crank my vehicle up, pulling off onto the roadway. And that's when I see it. You know how at the gas stations, they have the little panels up above the pumps where they do the marketing where it says Shell or Exxon. Those huge metal bars with the signs attached to it. Well, I'm looking through the rear view mirror and I see what looks like a freaking hyena. But this ain't no little bitty hyena up on top of that metal. And listen to me when I tell you this. The level of fear and adrenaline that flushes through your body when you see something like that. Oh my God, I felt like I was having a heart attack. Now listen to me when I explain this to you. The most terrifying thing of it all is that this happened at the height of the coronavirus outbreak. Everybody was afraid. Nobody was outside. The roads were empty. And looking back on it now, had that thing decided it was going to take and eat me, the only thing they would have found was my car. My black ass would have been a goner. abandoned my money is almost gone and my health is failing how did i get to this point mistakes many 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 mistakes now i find myself alone on my family land in kentucky hard to believe that i used to be one of the most powerful men in the state when i tell you i have nothing i mean i have nothing but this house and the property that my grandfather left me 65 acres and at my age it's hard to maintain that type of land now the first time i realized i was not alone out here in these woods was the day i decided to smoke some chicken i placed four whole chickens in a smoker went inside took a nap came back and two of those chickens are missing understand my smoker is an iron box and you literally have to use your hands to open it understand as i'm standing there confused all kind of thoughts run through my mind i know for a fact i put four chickens in this smoker but I could not come up with any kind of explanation for why two of them went missing. A week later, I'm sitting on the porch, drinking coffee, and reading my newspaper when this feeling overwhelms me. The feeling that someone is in the wood lines watching me. You know that feeling, you know when you're being watched. But looking around, I don't see anybody, so I let it go. That same night, at 3.45 in the morning, I hear someone walking around outside. Then I can hear the doorknob on the back door twisting and turning. Now, when I get up, get my shotgun and venture to the back side of the house, I don't see anything. But then things continue to get weird. A few days later, I have to go get a new battery for my truck. You know how you can tell when your truck is about to go dead, it's struggling to start? Now, coming back home, pulling into the driveway, I catch a glimpse of what I thought was a gray tail. And what I mean by tail? It looked like a dog had just turned the corner on the back side of my house. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, somebody's dog done got loose and is running around on my property. So I drive around the back side of the house and I see what looks like a large, gray, skinny wolf. And by skinny, I mean meat and bones, starving, skinny wolf, walking on four legs, limping back into the wood line. Now, honestly, seeing this wolf was kind of comforting to me because at least I had a way of explaining what happened to my chickens. Never mind the fact that this wolf would have had to open the door. Listen, at that point in time, I just justified it all away. Never mind the fact that the wolf would have had to open the iron door and get in there and get the chickens. 
it just kind of all made sense to me so i justified it away saying look you left the door to the smoker open went inside took a nap the wolf hopped up there grabbed two chickens and went on about his business so now i'm aware that there's a wolf on my property the following weekend i fire up the smoker and get to cooking again except for this time i take half of a raw chicken toss it into the wood lines for what i thought was just an old wolf i need you to understand my thought process here i'm alone this wolf look old and sick and i figured look we old guys need to stick together a few hours later i walk over check that spot and the chicken's gone so over the next few weeks as i cook i toss some food in the exact same spot every time i go over and check it's gone now listen to this one evening i'm on the back side of my house and i see someone walking on my property i holler trying to get his attention the man looks over his shoulders and keeps walking now if i was a younger man i would have chased him down because he had no right to be on my property but i'm 72 years old the only thing i'm running to right now is the bathroom listen that very same night about 11 30 11 40 p.m i hear what sounds like someone kicking my back door again i'm alone out here by the time I get to my shotgun, the door frame is cracked, door is wide open, and I can see this man wearing all black, mask on, six foot three, about 200 pounds, coming into my house fast, raising the shotgun, pull the trigger, and the damn gun is not loaded. Why? Because I cleaned it the other day and forgot to load the freaking gun. Him seeing me with the shotgun forces him to hesitate, but as soon as he realizes it's not loaded, he begins to walk in my direction. And I'm thinking to myself, this son of a bitch didn't break in my house in the middle of the night wearing all black and a mask to play a game of cards. I am fucked. There is no way I can fight this man. But you know what? You know what? I'm going to try. If he gets close enough to me, I'm just going to kick him in the nuts. But things didn't go the way I planned. Within seconds, this man done knocked me down to the ground. He's climbing on top of me and has a hammer in his hand. But... Before he can raise his arm, we hear a growl. Now listen to me, when I tell you that this growl was loud, Jesus God, this was loud. Do you remember being a kid playing one, two, three, red light? And as you played that game, everybody just froze in whatever pose you were in? Well, that's what happened. Me, frozen, my arms covering my face. Him, frozen, reaching his arm back. I peep around my hand. Nervously, these words come stumbling out of my mouth. That's my dog. If you don't get the fuck out of here, he's going to eat you alive. Listen, I don't have a dog, but that was the first thing that came to my mind. Then it growls again, but louder, and that growl morphs into a roar. I swear to you, it sounded like a freaking dinosaur. He jumps up, turns around, and runs out of the door. Now, pause for a moment right here and allow me to take my time and paint this picture clear for you because that's when it happened have you ever seen the discovery channel when one of those great white sharks does a surprise tack on a seal they just explode out of nowhere hitting the seal and it's gone well that's what this animal did to him as he's running out of the door you see his body running out of the door the next second it's like he's got hit by a wrecking ball i watch as his body is literally in one smooth motion picked up and shifted straight to the right out of sight and by the time i get up move to the back door peeping out all you can hear is him screaming and hollering in the woods now to make sure you understand exactly what i'm saying this happened fast so fast that all i saw was a quick glimpse of gray fur listen to me there are no words to articulate what i was feeling and thinking in that moment was i afraid yes the adrenaline pumping through my body was giving me a headache my heart was racing my eyes literally felt like they were going to burst out of my head as my brain tried to process this shit that i saw the only thing i could think to do was to close that back door go get a two by four and nail it shut then i got in my truck left and ended up spending the night sleeping in my truck in the walmart parking lot 18 miles away listen to this the next morning when i get back home all i find is his shoe understand i'm still scared out of my mind so i call my oldest son and i literally beg him beg him 
just to come over and sit with me. I couldn't tell him what I saw over the phone because he would think I had lost my mind. But my child hangs up the phone in my face. At that point in time, I told myself, the only thing you can do is try and get back to normal. But I just couldn't shake it. Something took this man. For the next 14 days, I did not leave my house at night. And when I moved around in the daytime, I was completely paranoid, checking doors, looking through windows, but absolutely nothing happened. So finally, I'm comfortable and I'm trying to get back to normal. And I tell myself, listen, you got to get back to your routine. Let's get out here, turn this smoke on, start cooking these chickens for the week. And I go right back to doing what I had been doing before. The only difference is instead of leaving a half of a chicken in the wood line, I left a full chicken in that wood line. Now, when I tell you what happened next, I will never, ever forget. I mean it. On my desk bed, this will probably be my last memory. I had just closed the smoker, turned around, and see this skinny wolf standing on two legs next to a tree watching me. I started to get the feeling that it wanted me to see it, like it was revealing itself to me because it stood there for a solid two and a half minutes just looking. Now talk about being shocked, surprised, and amazed. It was standing on two legs. But then somehow it takes two steps back, was into the shade of the trees and disappears. Now to be clear with you, this wolf was great. I still should have been able to see it, but it was there and then it was gone. But in that two minutes, I realized something. That wolf had made a conscious decision, not only to show itself to me, but to protect me. And instantly, all the fear and anxiety just drained away. The following weekend, I'm out there smoking chickens again. I'm expecting to see it, right? Head on over there, put the chicken in the wood line, head back to the smoker, get it started, smoke the rest of the chickens, head inside. I turn around looking, but it's not there. Head inside, get a glass of water, come back out, Walk back over to the area, and that chicken's gone. Now listen to me when I tell you this. I have not seen it since, but you can still feel them watching me, but not in like this creepy, paranoid, stalking kind of way. It's kind of like when you were a kid and you went to the park with your parents. You may have ran 20, 30, 40, 50 yards away from them. You're not even paying attention to your parents. But you know, you just know, you can feel them watching you. Now, as I move around my property, it's a lot like that. I know it's watching over me. It all started with my mom fussing. Boy, I did not tell you to take that damn trash out. Now, my mom wasn't one of those new school moms. She was straight up old school. I'm talking about take off the belt and whoop your ass old school. So I put down the Nintendo, grabbed the trash, head outside, down the steps, into the parking lot, over to the dumpster. And in the direction of the dumpster on the far side of the lot. Now, as I'm walking along, I start to hear this breathing sound. But not a normal breathing, like a man breathing. This sounded more like someone breathing and gargling water at the same time. And this fear jumps inside of me. I'm talking about the feeling that you need to run and get back inside of the house. So now I'm sprinting towards the dumpster, garbage bag held close to my chest, jumping, shooting that entire garbage bag like Kobe Bryant over the fence into the dumpster, landing on the ground, turning around, sprinting back in a direction towards my front door. And as I glance over to the wood line next to the apartment, that's when I see it. Eight feet tall, naked, pale skin, body like a man, no male genitals. And the most insane thing about what I saw was that this creature had a head that was enormous. Back then, we used to make fun of people and say that they had water heads. But no, this thing's head was the size of three normal man's heads. Listen to me when I tell you I'm running full speed, head turned, looking in its direction and you know those little concrete blocks that they put in the parking lots they're normally sprayed yellow the ones that they put in place to keep your vehicle from moving too far forward well i trip over one of those slam into the wall hit the ground roll around 
And when I stand up and look in that direction again, it's now moved from the tree line and is halfway across the parking lot coming in my direction. Afraid, confused, and scared out of my mind. Now my hands are on the wall trying to climb back up. And as I turn that corner headed towards my front door, I see my next door neighbor, Marshall. He's standing outside, leaning on a brick wall, smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, dude, get inside. There's something in the parking lot. Come on, hurry up. Get inside. Now, listen to me. I felt like that was all the warning I needed to give him. I didn't need to explain to him what I saw. From that point in time, I dart into the apartment, close and lock the door and head directly to my room. A few moments later, and I mean a few moments later, I hear glass shattering and I hear Marshall outside screaming. Again, my mother is saying, boy, go outside and see what the hell is going on out there. But I already had some kind of idea of what was going on outside. And I wasn't opening that front door under any circumstances. Now, tiptoeing over to the front window, moving the blinds, looking out, I see Marshall standing there with a bat in his hand, eyes wide open, and he looks like he just saw a ghost. He sees me looking at him through the window, signals for me to come outside, and I begin to move my head right to left saying, no, 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 not coming out there. That's not going to happen. Again, he signals for me to come outside. And this time I mouth to him, no, no. I know what's out there. I'm not coming outside. Finally, now he's screaming at me saying, hey, man, come outside. You need to see this. So timidly, I walk out of the front door. And as I approach, he starts to explain to me what happened. You see, when I went inside the house, that eight foot tall thing turned the corner right behind me, scared the hell out of him. So he goes to his car, grabs his bat off the back seat and takes a swing at it. Now get this, he tells me, when that bat made connection with its flesh, it began to absorb the bat itself. So much so that he had to literally yank the bat from inside of this creature's body. He swung at it again, hitting it in its head, and that's when it turned around and went in the other direction. Now listen to me, back in those days we lived in a very small town and I had never ever heard of anything paranormal happening. In fact, I have never heard of anything paranormal happening in that town, but it was just my luck. And that figures because I've had bad luck all my life. And it was just my luck. I run into a big, gigantic pumpkin. There be werewolves in these mountains. That's exactly what the camp counselor said while we are all sitting around the fire at summer camp. Did I believe him? Hell no. Was he right? You bet your ass he was. We're two weeks in the summer camp. It's fishing day and all the campers in the camp 